How are you doing today? Are you feeling blue or seeing red? Those two colors can stir the strongest of emotions in many of our lives. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, Labour or Conservative, Liverpool or Everton, or would you take the blue pill or the red pill? I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and in this video, I'm going to be looking at these, the two most famous Beatles compilation albums, how they came about and how they sound. To help me on this noble quest, I've got 16 different copies, eight red and eight blue, each from a different era and from different parts of the world. And later on, I'll be telling you which one I think sounds the best. This was the first Beatles album I bought with my own money way back in January 1977. And like so many others, it was a giant leap for me into the Beatles music. It was swiftly followed by this copy of 1962 to 1966, which for some reason, despite being bought new from a market stall in Cambridge, is an Italian copy. But for my money, neither as a compilation have ever been bettered. The Beatles stock in 1972 and early 1973 was about as low as it could possibly go. They were yesterday's news. The fan club had closed down, there were no Beatles conventions, no Beatles tribute bands, and even the Beatles themselves wanted nothing to do with the Beatles. But things were about to change, courtesy of a small company based in New Jersey. That company was called Audio Tape Incorporated, and they, using copies and needle drops made from the Capitol albums, put together two lo-fi ramshackle double compilation albums called Alpha Omega. In late 1972, it began to be advertised on radio, TV and in print and became available for mail order in January 1973 for $13.95. Like today, Apple is one company you don't want to mess with legally, especially if the boss was Alan Klein. He immediately filed a $15 million lawsuit against audio tape, which brought production and distribution of the set to an abrupt end. However, it's unclear as to whether or not Apple got its money, but the objective had been achieved and the album was off the streets. The whole sordid affair must have made Klein realise that he was missing a trick, and more importantly, missing out on making money. So he instructed his team at his company Abco to come up with something special to get the Beatles back into the charts, and this was the result. 1962 to 1966 and 1967 to 70, otherwise known as the Red and the Blue albums. Despite TV ads at the time saying that the songs for the albums had been chosen by the Beatles themselves, they, despite being invited to give their input, wanted nothing to do with it. The track listing was in the end put together by an Abco employee and was cleverly designed to include just original compositions without any cover versions. As well as having nothing to do with the track listing, it appears that no Beatle had anything to do with the cover design either. Now, all of their album covers are works of art in their own right, and Sgt Pepper is always held up as being their best. But for me, the cover for this album is up there on that same level. Using the Please Please Me image together with the aborted Get Back album cover shot was a stroke of genius. Both images are fairly unremarkable in their own right. But when placed side by side, or back to back in this case, they become truly fascinating. Like the Sgt Pepper's cover, I used to stare at this for hours, constantly comparing and being fascinated by how much they'd changed, and if they were in fact the same people. Another great aspect of this album is that the lyrics are on the inner sleeve. Although it wasn't common practice at the time, someone recognised how important the lyrics to these songs were. To study or analyse lyrics back then, you had to write them down yourself, but having them there inside the album printed for you was pure gold. Another thing which surprises me is that neither of these albums got to number one in the UK, which I think had a lot to do with the price. 1973 was a tough time economically, and this album retailed for £3.99, which was premium price back then. 
Inflation adjusted, that adds up today to £53, or $74. Although the Blue Album reached the top spot in the US for a short time, it must have been seen as a bit of a fail by Beatles standards. But of course, it wasn't just about the US and the UK. These albums were released in multiple countries around the world, where they were just as popular, so combined worldwide sales must have been massive. Talking of worldwide releases, that brings us nicely to the real purpose of this video, to find out what I think are the best sounding vinyl versions. Over the years, I've collected, or should I say accumulated, quite a few copies of this album. There seems to be at least one in nearly every collection I've bought. The majority are UK copies, but there have been some interesting international copies, which I'm going to look at more in detail right now. Let's start off with the UK pressing. EMI pressings in general from this date are second to none. But these albums were amongst the final releases before the oil crisis hit in 1974. That led to a shortage and a rise in the price of PVC, vinyl's main ingredient. So in order to rein in spiralling costs, EMI began to experiment with the use of extender resins, or fillers if you like, which unfortunately led to a poorer quality grade of vinyl in the years which followed. So these early copies are really the ones you want to go for if you want the best quality vinyl. The source material was impeccable, as most tracks were copied directly from the original album master tapes. For example, here's the tape box for side two of the Beatles for Sale album, from which they took eight days a week. As you might be able to see, the copy date is written in red ink as 21st of March 1973, followed by B1, Band 1, and then four Beatles package. Here's side one of Help, which showed that B7 and B3 were copied on the same day. Four tracks were taken from side one of Rubber Soul, band one, two, four, and seven. And three more from Sgt. Peppers for the Blue Album, which were copied two days later on the 23rd of March. Of course, there were no true stereo mixes of Love Me Do or She Loves You, so those were in simulated stereo. From a mix variation point of view, there was little to get excited about on either album. Only the whispering intro on I Feel Fine, lasting just a couple of seconds, was new to anyone. But back then, anything new was like gold dust. Whilst the UK was treated to the best source material available, it was a very different story over in the US. Instead of picking up the phone and ordering quality masters from London, Capital decided not to bother and used whatever they had lying around on their shelves, which was certainly a mixed bag. For example, you get the reverb drenched but hit mono mix of I Feel Fine, the Yesterday and Today mix of Day Tripper, and help with that wacky James Bond intro, which a lot of people actually prefer over the clean version. They also had to endure simulated stereo versions of I Want to Hold Your Hand, together with dirty mono mixes of A Hard Day's Night, Ticket to Ride, Penny Lane and Hello Goodbye. Other countries, as we'll see shortly, were more than happy to receive a mixture of copy tapes and metal mothers from EMI in London, which gave them a more consistent and better sounding product. Obviously, I don't have every pressing from every country, but I've got a decent selection here to work with, which should give us a good cross-section. If you have a good sounding one that I don't mention, let us know all about it in the comments. So here I have 16 different pressings, 8 red and 8 blue. So let me introduce the contenders. Firstly, in the red corner, a 1973 UK first pressing, a UK 1978 red vinyl, a German first pressing, a Deutsche Grammophon contract pressing, both of which are local cuttings from UK tapes, a US capital pressed in LA, a South African pressing, which uses UK first pressing mothers, the 1994 UK Red Vinyl Edition, which uses digital masters. And finally, the latest 2014 analogue reissue. And in the blue corner, we've got, again, UK first and blue vinyl pressings, the German first press, and a Sono press contract pressing, a French contract pressing for Germany, 
a 1980s Greek pressing, a 1973 Capital Winchester pressing, and finishing off again with the 2014 analog edition. Finally, this cool looking French box set from 1981, which contains both sets, all inside the colored inner sleeves. So let's kick off with 1962 to 1966, and first up is the UK first pressing. Now this is the true benchmark of how this album should sound. All of the tracks are dynamic and full of life. The sound is warm, clean and clear in all of the right places, and it's really difficult to fault on any level. The 1978 red vinyl, however, is a completely different animal. For this edition, they didn't use the same mothers as the first pressing. It was totally recut, especially for this release, which is why it has unique hand etched matrices rather than the machine stamp ones of the first pressing. It's also a good 20 grams heavier. Despite that extra weight and superb looks, it's a real disappointment. The sound is really muffled and lacks any of the presence of the first pressing and is definitely a case of style over substance. The first German pressing is closer to the UK first pressing with a slight bass roll off, but still clean and warm and nicely balanced in all departments. The vinyl is really quiet too. The Deutsche Grammophon pressing is a little more refined, but it's too close to call cool between the two, but you wouldn't be disappointed with either. Unfortunately, I don't have the widely praised DMM pressing of this album, but maybe someone who does will chime in with their opinion. The US pressing is a completely different animal, and it's impossible to compare it to other pressings because it uses so many different masters and unique versions. For what it's worth, it sounds okay, and it's the only way to get your nostalgic fix of the cavernous I Feel Fine and the James Bond intro on help. Being pressed from UK first press metalwork, the South African pressing sounds really excellent. It's cut much louder than the UK pressing and sounded great on my system. It's certainly the first in this test to be on the same level as the UK first pressing. The French album from the double box set was very smooth. And whilst it didn't have the full on energy of the UK pressing, it has a very pleasing, well-mannered sound. The UK 1994 red vinyl was cut from digital and it sounds like it. It's brittle and flat and fatigued my ears after only a few tracks. If you really must have this on colored vinyl, go for the 1978. The 2014 has just two significant changes from the first pressing in that the simulated stereo mixes of Love Me Do and She Loves You have been replaced by mono versions, which doesn't bother me at all. All the tracks sound just as great as the 1973 pressing and is miles better on the ear than the fatiguing digital red vinyl I looked at earlier and is for my money the best of the bunch and of course the easiest to get hold of for now. Now let's move on to the blue and first up again is the UK first pressing. This is a wonderful sounding pressing with everything perfectly balanced rich controlled bass with superb mids and the highs all in the right places. Everything sits together perfectly and it's going to be hard to beat in this test, but let's see. Thankfully, the blue vinyl pressing doesn't suffer from any of the lack of high end as its contemporary red vinyl version. In fact, it sounds superb and it's difficult to split this and the first pressing. If you see one, snap it up. It's a real winner and it looks great too. The German first pressing is decent enough, but it sounds rather distant in comparison and lacks the sparkle of the UK pressing, leading me to believe that it was pressed from a UK copy tape rather than tapes from their own library. The German Sono press has more bass and a fuller sound overall and might be worth seeking out if you're into German pressings. The French contract and double box set pressing is like the red set, not as in your face as the German or UK pressings, but is very refined. There's a lot of detail in the mid range, which gives a real transparency to the vocals. It's a very enjoyable pressing, which really impressed me. Another which also surprised me was the Greek pressing, which are not normally known for their sound quality. But this later pressing was every bit as good, if not better than the German pressing. Unlike on the Red Album, where you've got a couple of unique nostalgic mixes, there's very little to get misty-eyed about on the Capital Pressing, 
Unless, of course, you enjoy those nasty sounding vintage stereo mixes from the Magical Mystery Tour album. The 180 gram discs of the 2014 edition sound a little more compressed than the first pressing, but have more details on the vocals. Some of the later tracks are a touch bright, but the wonderful bass is still there. In fact, it's superb and I could listen to it all day long. Another important detail here is that unlike the 1994 and 2010 editions, the 2014 issues were cut from analog tapes and give us a tantalizing glimpse into what an all analog stereo box set would actually sound like. Unfortunately though, that doesn't look like it's going to happen. But if you're watching Apple, there's plenty of people here who would buy it, right? I hope you found these comparisons interesting, and if you see one of these around on your travels, maybe you'll take a closer look at it. It says here on the sticker that it's a limited edition, so I'm guessing that as it came out a good seven years ago, there might not be that many left in stock at the usual places. So do yourself a favour and get one while you can. There's more great sounding Beatles vinyl on our website, parlogramauctions.com, and you can keep in touch with us there or via Facebook and Instagram, or even do us the honor of becoming a channel member. But that's all for this one, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching. Music